Welcome to the Dream Power Show, where your dreams turn into reality. Here is your host, Debbie Specter Weissman. Welcome to the Dream Power Show. I'm your host, Debbie Specter Weissman, the Dream Coach. There are so many forces working against us in our quest to live the most powerful lives possible. I mean, turn on the TV and news about climate change, war, Supreme Court decisions, and the seemingly never-ending pandemic is enough to make you want to stay in bed all day with the covers over your head. Closer to home, family, health, and work issues can bog you down and make you feel like you're living in a rut. But like regular listeners to this program know, often we can be our own worst enemies, stuck in a loop of negative thoughts and beliefs that keep us small and make us feel that we can never achieve our dreams. But my guest, optimal health strategist Gunther Mueller, has worked for years to educate and inspire people to take charge of their lives. And he's dedicated to showing them how to create lives they love through the Magnetic Mind program. Welcome to the Dream Power Show, Gunther. Hey, Debbie, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And yes, I am all about teaching people how to create the life that they love, even in the midst of fear, uncertainty, and chaos that you mentioned earlier. Yes, well, tell me, what got you interested in wanting to help people live their powerful lives? Well, you know, I've been on that quest for truth all of my life, and uh, I believe I've discovered how to manifest the reality that uh, I love and desire. And so I'm all about sharing it with as many people as I can. My goal is to, you know, affect 10 million people's lives potentially to change their life destiny by inspiring them to take action, to do some simple, practical things that will literally leverage the quantum physical reality that we live in and so that you can actually attract a different result into your, I think you call it your daytime life. Yes, I tell you, that's wonderful. I mean, the whole idea of you inspiring, you know, 10 million people, and then they go out and inspire 100 million people, I mean, whatever the exponential factor of, of that is. Right. And, and we have a different, hopefully better world that we live in. But tell me, what do you feel is the biggest impediment that keeps people stuck where they are? The biggest impediment for sure is our own personal identity that we have crafted over our lifetime. I like to call it our life stream. From the time we came into the world, we got popped out of the womb, which kind of was like a Ritz Carlton five-star experience, right? We get popped out of the womb and then we have to figure out what it's like here. We have to figure out what we need to do to get love, what we need to do to get food and shelter and acceptance and protection. And ever since that moment, that's what we've been doing. And we've been making decisions about how life is here. And some have gone through massive traumas, abuses, bad situations in life. Of course, there's been good things that have happened as well. But throughout that in life stream, we have crafted an identity that has some self-sabotaging aspects to it. So this is sitting in the subconscious program. It runs completely unconsciously, kind of like Windows 10 runs your computer. You don't know how Windows 10 runs your computer. You just know that it does and you use it for some productive purposes, but there's a code. And every once in a while, there's an update that gets loaded down to that code. You restart your machine and hopefully the machine runs a little bit smoother and a little bit better. That's exactly what we need to do in our subconscious to get a different result in our daytime reality. Mm, I, I think you said that so well. And the truth is that so many people just go through their lives not even realizing any of this because it is in our subconscious and and we're just not aware of it. So tell me, you are a proponent of something called the magnetic mind method. I talked about it in the intro. So tell me, what, what is that? So the magnetic mind method is a five-step method that is very practical. And uh, if we do it in repetition, you'll see that the results in your life change. And mainly what it's about, it's about stepping out of the problem-solving reality and taking what I'm going to call the creator stance to remember your creative power. And your creative power starts with your ability to choose. 
If you think about your life, the only power that we really have in life is the power to choose. From the moment you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed at night, you're choosing what time you wake up, what clothes you're going to wear, how you're going to get to work, what you're going to eat, uh, all the different decisions that you make. And if you look back at your lifetime, you'll see that it's a it's a perpetual progression of decisions that have gotten you into the present moment experience that you're in right now. So in effect, I can confidently say that you have created your current reality, this daytime dream reality that we're in, maybe call it a holographic movie that you're experiencing. You're the producer, you're the director, you wrote the script, you handed everybody their parts, and the world is not happening to you. It's actually happening for you to reflect the identity that you have created throughout your life to this point. So the first step, again, is getting that real true choice, right? And you know you're in a true choice when you can say, I want it just because I want it. I want it because I just love to experience it. The second step is to create a structural tension in the mind. The mind needs to resolve tension. So we're going to create a tension, which is just saying, what's it like now? We have this true choice. We have the desire. And we can see what that is or imagine what that is. And then we can look at the way it is now. So we create a contrast not in a negative way, not in a judgmental way. You can still be content with the current reality. You can still be okay with the current reality, just looking at it and saying, look, what is, is just what is. It doesn't have to be bad. It doesn't have to be terrible. But in this present moment, you do have the power to choose something different. And notice I didn't say something better. I said something different because as, as soon as we say the future is going to be better than the present, we kind of anchor ourselves in the present. When we look at the future as just being a different experience than the present, we kind of let that energy off the now, off the current reality, and just allow it to be what it is. So the second step is just to notice this is what I want. This is the way it is now. This is what I'd love to have. This is the way it is now. Then the third step is to really get into the emotion of the end result. We have to feel that true choice. Some people, you know, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs. They, you know, want to build their businesses. And I say, why do you want to build the business? Well, because I want this huge house and I want to drive a Ferrari and I want to do this kind of thing. And that's what I'll be doing when I'm successful. And I don't care about driving a Ferrari. I want to know what it feels like to drive a Ferrari. I want to know what it feels like to live in a 20,000 square foot house. I want to know what it feels like when you have freedom, right? Or abundance and things like that. So the third step is really getting into the emotion. And I want you to think about our Olympic athletes. They do more training in their mind because the mind does not know the difference between imagination or even call it dreaming, right? Versus reality. To the mind, dreaming and imagination is the same as reality. It sees it, feels it, experiences it exactly the same way. So Olympic athletes imagine themselves breaking a new world record. They imagine themselves on the gold medal podium receiving that medal, right? And seeing the stand going nuts and the applause and seeing them beat their competitor by one one hundredth of a second. This is imagined more than the work that they do, let's say, in the swimming pool or on the track or on the ski slope. They're doing it in their mind more than they do it in the real world. So we can do that as well. We get into the emotion of the end result, which is what is it going to feel like when I become that future version of myself? When I have that thing that I would just love to experience, what's it really going to feel like? And we get into that feeling. Then the fourth step, what we do in the magnetic mind method is we do a recode. It takes about 15 minutes. Instead of attacking the subconscious mind from the conscious level, we go to the super conscious level, and this is where we download that update into the subconscious program. It takes about 15 minutes. As a coach, I go and speak with that subconscious version of yourself and clients just feel like somebody's crawling around in their head a little bit. Maybe they see visions of the past or colors or something. It doesn't matter. You can't screw it up. You can't do it wrong. You don't have to be a spiritual person. You don't have to be an expert meditator or anything like that. You just calm down, notice where you are. I do the work on that part. And I do this recode where you actually feel a shift in that identity. All right. And what we're shifting is really the sabotaging identities that exist in our subconscious program. And those identities sound like I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm not capable. I'm not perfect. I don't belong. 
and a myriad of variations around those base thoughts that have come from decisions we've made about life. They no longer serve us where we are today. So when we shift the identity, we create a new possibility to experience something new in the waking world. So when you say you do this recode, is that like hypnosis or what kind of nope. thing? Totally conscious. You're not going to sleep. You're just going to hear me talk to your super conscious. And this is where it does help to have a coach in the beginning to do this uh, until you learn to do it yourself. So it's totally possible to learn to do it yourself and uh, learn the five steps. So the fourth step is one where you might need a little bit of help in uh, connecting with your super conscious side, asking for this recode into the subconscious program. And then the fifth step is once we do that, we say, okay, what's the next obvious action? that's in alignment with that true choice, because this is where the law of attraction and the secret and, you know, positive mental attitude and affirmations and things like that kind of drop the ball. We need to be in action. We need to take action towards that true choice. And it doesn't have to be a big action step. It just has to be a step that's in alignment with that true choice. It has to be an obvious movement or action towards that reality. And I'll give you an example, like in health and vitality, people say, you know, I want to experience health and vitality. An obvious action step might be to drink more water, just to hydrate more. It might be to eat less fast food and more natural, you know, organic food. It may be to make a phone call to your doctor because you, you haven't had a medical appointment in 10 years. Small, obvious actions that move you towards that true end result and committing to take that action step. That's what the fifth step is right so and and it's important to note that it doesn't have to be some great giant leap it can right. be but i like to call baby steps yes take one because one little step will lead to the next little step and the next little step basically what you're right. saying yeah and that's how you to answer your earlier question this is how you build up let's say the perseverance or the persistence or the patience you you become okay with taking small steps to your true choice, to your true end result. And experience the journey. Be okay with the progression of your life. A lot of us, we're, we're so microwave in our thinking that, you know, we want it all now. And the truth is, it doesn't work that way. You need to have a contentment and basically a love for the journey, the experience of getting there. What human people really, really enjoy is actually the experience of progress. How many times have you chosen something or achieved success or achieved something and you get there and you're like, eh, is this all there is? I got this thing, right? You buy a new car, maybe you're excited for two, three days or something like that. And you're like, eh. Yeah, well, doesn't, that, doesn't that also get down to the why he wanted it in the first place? Yeah, so having some purpose and having a why. And again, the why can be, I want it just because I want it. I want it because I would just love to experience. The purpose comes through in more of an orientational true choice, which is like, you know, I choose to live my nature and purpose, my true nature and purpose. I just choose to live my life that way. And I choose to live the life that I love. I choose to be the predominant creative force in my life. I choose to be healthy and vital versus coming from a problem solving reality let's say in the health space again, where you say, you know, I got to beat cancer or I have to beat Alzheimer's and dementia or I have to beat cardiovascular disease or I have to solve this problem. It's very different to back out of that and just say, look, I choose infinite optimal health. I choose to experience vitality and feeling amazing in my body. And then letting the universe, letting that quantum physical field bring the solution, bring the opportunity. You don't have to figure it out in every step. Things will show up for you. And this is what I mean by creating the life you love. It's all comprehensive. When you learn to do these five steps and you do them regularly, maybe once a day, twice a day, you're getting into that true choice. You're seeing what it feels like to be there. You're creating that structural tension between what I'd love to have and the way it is now. You engage in a couple of recode sessions and then you take the obvious action. And if you do that on a regular basis, you will see that your life will transform. How can people find out more about you and the Magnetic Mind Method? 
Yeah, I love it. So the best place to go is dreamlifemasters.com with an S, dreamlifemasters.com. I have some uh, complimentary materials on there. Download a morning ritual to kind of get you started in this direction, things to think about how to make these true choices and decide on some action steps that lead you in the right direction. There's also a, a place where you can join one of my webinars where I go more into the science and I go into deeper detail around how this all works. We've been speaking to optimal health strategist, Gunther Mueller. We'll be right back with our next guest. Many of us have had periods in our lives when we struggled and have had to overcome obstacles thrown at us. These could have been obvious difficulties, like a job loss or a broken relationship that anyone could see and understand. There are also those hidden issues, like lack of self-esteem or questions about identity and purpose that are deeply felt but are invisible to those around us. But what about those who've been dealt hardships at birth? How are they able to find purpose and passion in their lives? We're about to find out how one such person overcame her challenges and became an inspiration to many. Mandy B. Anderson was born with cystic fibrosis and has gone on to become a best-selling author, TEDx speaker, and a leadership coach. She's also the co-founder of Rayma Team, a women-owned business that offers life and leadership coaching for women. Welcome to the Dream Power Show, Mandy. Thank you so much, Debbie. I'm excited and honored to be here with you. Well, I am so happy that you're joining us now. Mandy, I'll tell you, when we're kids, we all have dreams of what we want to do when we grow up. Mm -hmm. But you have had a life-threatening disease from birth. When did you first become aware that you had cystic fibrosis? And how did that affect your childhood and any dreams you might have had? Well, first of all, I love this question and I don't get asked very often about the dreams I had when I was a kid. Um, well, I was born with cystic fibrosis and my parents found out that I was diagnosed with it when I was six months old. So I don't really have a moment in time where I lived a life and didn't, didn't have the awareness of it. As a kid, I was always told by my parents that I could do and be anything that I wanted as long as I stayed responsible and took care of myself. And so from a very young age, they instilled in me the ability to put together my own treatments for breathing medication, um, to, you know, figure out how to take my own enzymes, because that's part of cystic fibrosis as well. So I think being a kid, I was always aware of the fact that I had CF. I'm also a dreamer myself. As a kid, I wanted to be a singer. And I worked really hard at crafting that. And part of the, the miracle of my story is that I can sing, even though I have a life-threatening lung disease. And so I was always that kid who was going around pretending I was doing concerts, singing everywhere I went, telling people to call me, you know, Maid Marian or something like that. I had a very vivid imagination as a kid. So um, that's, that's really what it was like for me as a kid. I think the biggest thing though, when I was in fourth grade, I had somebody, another classmate, come up to me one day and tell me that I was going to die before I was 30 because she read in an encyclopedia that people with cystic fibrosis didn't make it into their 30s or even their 20s. And so that was kind of the moment where I realized this disease is very serious. Um, and I think that kind of just made me aware of the fact that I want to do everything I can as quickly as I can, just in case time ran out. Mm. So uh, did you ever have that feeling because, you know, all kids, I think, naturally want to rebel. Did you ever have a feeling of, oh, I don't need this medicine or I'm not going to do this or I'm just going to I would just want to be like everybody else and do everything that they're doing? You know, it's interesting because um, most kids with cystic fibrosis have that experience when they get to college. And that wasn't my experience. In fact, until my like late 20s, I was the person that did everything by the book. I always did my medicine. My medical team would actually ask if I would be okay with 
other parents getting in touch with me because they, they wanted to see that it's possible to be healthy with this disease. And so I never went through that period at the same time as everybody else. What happened was in my late twenties, I started growing really weary of living with CF. And I also started growing really weary of being in other people's hopes and prayers, but my lung functions were going down instead of up. So my rebellion period happened when I was like 28 and I decided that I, I went to a prayer service. I was prayed for cystic fibrosis to be gone. And unlike any other prayer services, I decided this time I'm going to put my faith into action. And I flushed all my medication down the toilet. I do not recommend that, by the way, if you live with a life-threatening disease and you need the medication. Um, but that put me into a two-year experience of really figuring out what does it mean to be healthy with cystic fibrosis. And by the end of that, I ended up in the hospital and almost died. And so what I've learned is sometimes a healing or, or a supernatural type of dream of being healed of a disease comes through a miracle that you can't explain, but a lot of times it comes through medicine. And so I'm thankful that I was able to get back to my health. I didn't need a lung transplant, which was a miracle in itself. And now I'm really thankful for the medicine because I have since gone on to run a half marathon and I've, I've really regained the lung functions that I had before I, I flushed my medication down the toilet. So how are you feeling right now? Good. Really great. Um, I'm on a new medication that came out a couple of years ago called Trikapta. And it's as close to a cure as they've been able to get yet with CF. So it's pretty exciting to, to be living in a world where that is happening in the CF community. And so, yes, I'm, I'm doing really well. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Uh, you said that you, you know, dream, were a dreamer when you were a child. Like you, dreamed, mm -hmm. you wanted to be a singer, but did you have nighttime dreams that you recall? I do. You know, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you because I am a very literal prophetic type of dreamer um, where I have had dreams that will happen usually a couple months down the road, like three to six months. I have had a dream once where it happened literally the next day. So it's a weird thing. My, my best friend is the co-founder of my company and we have conversations about dreams all the time. <laughs> Do you still rem you remember your dreams now? So you, you talk about them with, with your friend all the time? I do. Um, I, you know, I've gotten to the point where I think sometimes I wake up from a dream and I kind of know this is one I need to write down because something felt off. It felt like there was a message in the dream. And usually my dreams come in threes where it's either three dreams with the same type of message or the same type of theme, or I go deeper and deeper into the same story three times. And then once the third time comes around and I kind of get to the end of it, it kind of wraps itself up. So interestingly enough, I had some very um, prophetic type dreams while I wasn't taking my medicine. And it really had to do with what I was speaking over my life and what I was um, going to believe as far as the life that I was going to live. So did these dreams help you realize that you maybe should be going back on your medicine? Um, not necessarily right away. I think there was an underlying theme of fear in them. Um, but there was also a theme of making sure that I am speaking positively, but not, not necessarily for like positivity's sake, but just being very careful with my words and being very um, deliberate with the words that I was speaking over the situation. And you know, it's interesting because my doctors, um, not my doctors, one of my respiratory therapists has told me in the past that they have never seen somebody get that sick with cystic fibrosis and survive, especially without a lung transplant and be able to get their life back. And so I really think that a lot of the internal self-growth um, that I was doing and the, you know, diving into dream interpretations and um, really just digging deep, I really do think that was um, part of my process of making the decision that this wasn't where my story was going to end. Because I remember a day in the hospital where um, the first four days that I was in the hospital, and this was like a decade ago, I looked in the mirror 
and I didn't recognize my own face. I looked like death. My skin was gray. My cheeks were sunken in. There was no spark to my eyes. And I looked like the face of a lot of my friends who have passed away with cystic fibrosis. And in that moment, I made a choice and I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, Mandy, this is not how your story ends. No matter what your new normal is, you're going to make this count. And so I think that decision probably did come from being deliberate with my words and from those themes that were in my dreams. This sounds like this was your bottom. You know? Yeah. And a lot of times people have to hit bottom before they get to, you know, rise even higher than they were before. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you say that's what happened to you? And do you think that people have to reach bottom in order to succeed? You know, I sometimes think that you do have to reach bottom. I think there are valuable lessons to learn at rock bottom that you cannot learn any other way. You can hear them. You can listen to other people who have hit rock, rock bottom and learn lessons from them. But something happens when you experience it yourself. I think it produces in you a resilience to rise up and, and really go for it. I think it helps you get over your excuses as to why you haven't gone for something in the past. And so I really do think that you have to reach rock bottom. I know for me, health wise, that definitely was my rock bottom. Um, I've also hit rock bottom financially with my husband and I were six figures in debt around the same time. We had also lost our home to an apartment fire around this, like a year before I was so sick. And so um, all of that was just like the perfect rock bottom season that came to that just came to a head when I, when my health was going downhill. Yeah. So it was just a series of events. It was, it really was. Yeah. So a lot of times though, when people hit rock bottom, they stay there. So what, what was, what was it in you that was able to get you to rise up and be who you are now? Well, I think it was that because I'm a big dreamer, and because those dreams hadn't happened yet. Um, I remember about a, a few years before I was in the hospital fighting for my life. I remember laying on a massage table and I, I, I consider myself a person of faith. I'm a Christian and I have these conversations that I like to say are with God. And I remember having a, a conversation where I really felt like God was asking me, are you okay if your dreams don't happen until you're 40? And I remember just kind of thinking to myself, well, I guess so, because it means I get to live till I'm 40. And so in that moment, I mean, when I was in the hospital fighting for my life, I was 30 and I held on to that. And I thought, well, none of that stuff has happened yet. Like I haven't, I haven't done any of the things that I've been working on doing over the last two, three years. So I don't know that I'm going to look like a healthy person when I do them, or if I'm going to look like a sick person with cystic fibrosis, but I don't care what I look like. I'm going to make this count. Even if that means I have to have oxygen and, and all the things that I feared. And I think, I think that's really what, what kind of helped me step back up out of rock bottom. And thankfully a few years prior to that, I had started my own journey of personal growth and working with different coaches and really digging deep to, to challenge my own paradigms and figure out what it is I needed to do to succeed in life and go after the dreams I had. And so I think all of that together is what kind of helped me make it matter. How can people find out about you and your services? Absolutely. So the best place to find me is at raymateam.com. That's R-A-Y-M-A team.com. And from there, you'll be able to find our social media. Um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, that is my favorite social media site. It is Ms. Mandy B. Anderson. That's M-S-M-A-N-D-Y-B-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. -S We've been speaking with inspirational speaker, author, and entrepreneur, Mandy B. Anderson. We'll be right back with our next guest. What language are you speaking? I'm not talking about English or Spanish or Mandarin Chinese. I'm talking about the language of your voice. Do you speak from authenticity? 
Does your voice match the conviction of your beliefs? Or do you mold your voice to the whims of those around you? My guest, Dr. Denise Moore Revel, knows all about this literally. Trained as a speech pathologist, she spent years training people how to find their actual voice and learn how to speak. But eventually, she also moved on to help women discover their authentic selves and master the ability to speak their truths. How? Well, let's find out. Welcome to the Dream Power Show, Dr. Denise. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here today. <laughs> Dr. Denise, as I said in the intro, you're a speech pathologist. What made you decide to transition from helping people regain their actual voice to guide those to reclaiming their authentic voice? Well, like you said in the intro, you know, I have literally helped people find their voices as a speech language pathologist, whether through stuttering or articulation or I mean, I work with clients who have actual voice issues. And I found that um, it's kind of the same thing, you know, living authentically, finding your authentic voice, it's the same, it's the same work, you know, you got to really tap into it. I tell people all the time, your voice is uniquely yours. There are some speech pathologists who work as forensic uh, speech pathologists where they've been called into court to authenticate someone's voice. <laughs> and so your voice, your literal physical voice is yours. And so is your lived experiences. So um, my own personal journey of living my worth out loud, finding my own voice has helped me to help to inspire and to empower other women um, to do the same work. Did you find that being a speech pathologist was not your authentic self or were there other obstacles toward finding your voice? I don't think being a speech pathologist has been an obstacle. I think it has been a, um, uh, a godsend or a part of my journey and part of my destiny. Uh, again, I think communication is so important. You know, one of the quotes I have on my, in my private practice is that communication is the, is the foundation of the human connection, right? So how we communicate with one another is so important. But more importantly, how do you communicate with yourself? I think a lot of times we look outside of ourselves for answers and we hear, we hear so many outside voices that at one point in my life, I couldn't hear my own voice. <laughs> I couldn't hear my own thoughts. And so because of that, it caused me not to uh, be happy, fulfilled, even though I enjoy what I do as a speech pathologist, but there became a point where I, I just wasn't happy and I wasn't fulfilled. And, I, and I, I came to discover it was because I was not listening to my own voice. I was listening to too many voices outside of me and I was looking outside of me for the answers for my own happiness and for my own fulfillment. So my work as a speech pathologist had me, I listened to voices all the time, but I was like, you're not listening to the main voice that you should be listening to. Is that my voice? Am I, is that really what I say I want? Is that really how I want to live my worth out loud or is it someone else's voice that I'm listening to? And that's a question that I ask myself often. And that's a question we should all always ask ourselves. Is this what I want? Am I listening to the voice within my own heart? Or am I continuing to listen to outside voices say who I should be, how I should look, how I should work? What should I do? Am I listening to all, all, all these outside voices or am I really hearing the power of my own voice? That's the question that I ask myself all the time. And that's the question, again, I hope that your audience uh, begin to ask themselves as well. Yeah, I think something that goes along with that is, is uh, something that you just said a little bit earlier, which is that you were playing small. And I think that is so true for so many women that uh, whether it's, you know, we, we learn this as we, we are growing older or it's something within us, something in the society. So many of us spend so many years, maybe too many years playing small and not being true to ourselves. Why do you think that is true? Why do so many women have issues with their self-worth? Because it goes back to what I said a minute ago about so many voices, so many outside voices. There's so many voices telling us that we're not enough. We're not smart enough. We're not pretty enough. We're too fat. We're too skinny. Our hair is too long. Our hair is too short. All these different things. I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough because I don't have a college degree. I don't drive this kind of car. All these different things, all these different voices that come at us. And if we don't take the time to stop and really listen 
from within to say, what is true for me? What lights me up? You know, what lights you up may not light me up, but if I don't take the time to stop and discover that, then we get what we have. A lot of women, uh, one minute they this, one minute, next minute they should do this. And that is feeling insecure, unworthy, not good enough, not enough, and not understanding that at the end of the day, we are all amazing. And so now it's up to us to really own it, to embrace it, and to really live that out loud. Okay, I want to get to that word amazing, uh, because you describe your mission as helping women discover their amazingness. And as you, if you heard the introduction, I find this interesting because it, you heard this network is called the Amazing Women and Men of Power Network. So how do you define amazingness and how do women find it? Oh, my goodness. Again, um, it's not about finding it. It's about embracing it. It's already there. <laughs> it's already there. And so like the young lady said to me, she said, you need to own your amazing. She said, you have it. You already are. And so that's the message is that I try to tell people, you already are amazing. But again, when we listen to messages that say, well, you're not pretty enough. You're not this enough. You're not smart enough. All these different things. And we think we're not amazing. But at the end of the day, you know, I like to talk about how I have a book. And in one of the chapters in my book, which is my favorite, is called Divine Design. I believe in the creator. And I believe the creator created us on purpose and for a purpose. But to think about, there are over 7 billion people on the planet. And there's no one like you and me. We are all so unique. We're special. We are different. And to me, that's amazing. <laughs> That is, that is truly amazing. Think about it. No one has ever been created like me. There's no one currently like me and no one will be like me. I'm it. And to, to know that I have all the different gifts and talents and all these things all mesh and come together for uniquely me. And so I need to embrace that. I need to celebrate that. Diversity is beautiful, you know? And so I don't tell people to go find their amazing. I need for you to embrace it. It's all you already are amazing. The messages have been that we're not. And I tell people when you look at, you know, we have failures, we have shortcomings, and we think that because we messed up, we made a mistake, that those things undermine our value. They do not. I when I do my workshop, I use the example of a $10 bill. I hope a $10 bill. I say, how much is this? They're like, $10. I'll, 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 I'll crumble it up in my hand. How, how much is this worth? $10. <laughs> if, if I get it wet, how much is the value? It's still $10. Nothing outside of us, no mistakes, no uh, mishaps, no miss, whatever it is that you think disqualify you from being amazing, it's not true. At the core of who you are is amazing. So our job is to embrace it, is to not listen to all those outside voices that's telling us that we're not enough, that we're not smart enough, we can't have it, we're not worthy. If you work on just not listening to those voices, but really listening for within, you'll tell yourself, yeah, I, I am pretty good. <laughs> I am pretty amazing. I am, you know, hot stuff, whatever you want to say. But you really got to speak to yourself and empower the way so to embrace that you are amazing. Not to discover it, it's already there. Like the person told me, she said, you already own those things. She said, the problem is you don't own it. It ain't that you got to come and start being because you're already that. You're already amazing. So now let's just own it. <laughs> let's just own it. Yeah, I tell you, you know, I would agree, I would agree with you that we we are at our core all perfect human beings. And we don't always see that because of all the put to put it bluntly crap that is loaded in on us through all of our life experiences. So right, you're right. We do have that that necessity to own it. But let's say that you've spent a life being told you're not good enough, uh, you don't deserve it, you're not worthy. How do you stop those voices in your head that are saying that to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year? How do you stop that voice and listen to the voice that says, no, 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 I am amazing, I am wonderful, I am everything that I can be? I tell people it takes courage, it takes effort, and oh, you're amazing. Um, because there are 
uh, a lot of us who grew up not always hearing positive things or having positive experiences, but it's up to us now to say, well, that's what that person said, but I don't have to continue to embrace that. I can say, well, no, that's not true for me. And so it takes you making a decision that you're not going to listen to that anymore. And here's the thing is that it says, oh, you're amazing. I can't own it for you. I can't do the work for you. You can't do the work for me. So you have to make a decision that every day you're going to get up, you're going you're gonna to tell yourself, I am enough. No one else can tell you for yourself. That's why my work is all about what are you going to tell yourself? It's not about who, who am I for Debbie? It's like, who am I for Dr. Denise? What do I think about me? What do you think about you? And so it takes work. It takes effort. It takes loving on yourself. It takes surrounding yourself with positive people to remind you of who you are. So um, it is. it does take work. It does take effort, but it can be done. And you are worth the time and the effort. How do you keep a person motivated to take that action? You said said it takes work, it takes action. How do you stay motivated to continue on that journey? I think the motivation comes with um, taking small action um, because action creates momentum. And if you can get started, just, I tell people, just get a, just do a little bit. (laughs) Just do a little bit every day. You, You don't have to eat the whole elephant in one bite. Take a little bite. Because there is a lot of um, negative energy and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes a lot of negative childhood trauma that we got to move, right? And so it can be a lot to try to tackle um, at, at once. So I tell people, just do a little bit every day. Tell, you know, if, if nothing more than repeating an affirmation every day, then repeat an affirmation every day. You know, for me, I journal a lot. Sometimes uh, it takes me just journaling my, my negative thoughts and ideas, just getting those things out of me. Whatever your strategy is, it may be listening to motivation, excuse me, motivational podcasts like this one or um, listening to music. Do whatever it takes for you to get yourself, to get your mind in a, in a positive you know, framework, whatever it is for you. But every day, be intentional about it. You, know? you can't leave your, your happiness, your fulfillment up to anyone else. It's up to you. And so again, you're worth the effort. So every day, I'm intentional about setting up my day. This morning, I was listening to meditation music before I got on. You know, I did yoga before I started my day. You know, I'll do my prayers, whatever it is I need to help me to be positive and to feel good because I knew I had this interview with you today. I had had another meeting prior to this today and I wanted to make sure I was in a positive frame of mind. I wanted to um, deal with the self-doubt that may have come up so that I can be present. I can be, do the things that I need to do. So again, if it's just one little thing, pick one thing that you can do every day to keep you in that frame of mind. And so when you do one thing and then it turns into another thing, you got to build that momentum. And so there was a time in my life where I struggled with depression and really moving forward. And this is what I did. I said, every day, just try to do one little thing. And I kept building upon it and building upon it. And so now I don't struggle with depression like I did in the past. Or if I feel it coming on, I know what to do now because I got strategies. I got little things that I do. I put on some music or I'll um, read a scripture or I'll um, read, read our journal. I, I have things I have things in my tool belt now that keeps me going on a daily basis to keep me uh, in a positive frame of mind. Yeah, I think that is an important point you made here is that there is no one answer. Mm -hmm. Uh, And what can work for you might not work for somebody else. And what works for somebody else might not work for you. And you're right, the work, the work that comes is trying to discover what it is that keeps you motivated, that keeps you in that positive frame of mind. And, And you're right, it could be different things for different people. Uh, and it may change, even for yourself. Things that used to kind of motivate me um, a couple of years ago don't necessarily do it for me anymore, you know, but I've discovered some new things. So I'm like, oh, I really like doing that. Okay. So be open to discover um, new ways just to keep you positive in the right frame of mind and to keep you to move forward, take action. How can okay. people find out more about you and your services? Yeah, so... I always tell people to spend, look at, you know, go first to the um, website, which is ownyouramazingnow.com. Again, ownyouramazingnow.com. Uh, you'll learn a little bit more about me, the 
Um, you'll get the free handout we mentioned ago. Um, you can get an excerpt from my book, uh, the way to purchase the book as well, um, to learn about different events that may be coming up. Uh, another way is to reach out to me on Facebook. You can uh, find me at, at Dr. Denise on your amazing. Uh, that's where I do a weekly talk called um, Think About It Thursday. I come on every Thursday, just do a few, little, you know, a few minutes of inspiration, motivation, just to help us to be reflected on our lives. So again, website on your amazing and follow me on, um, I'm sorry, on Facebook at, at Dr. Denise on your amazing. We've been speaking about how to find your authentic voice with Dr. Denise Moore Revel. We'll be right back with our next guest. When my kids were growing up, the start of the school year was always a time of excitement. Excitement for my children, who were happy to see their friends on a daily basis, if not so happy about having to combine that with studies and homework. It was exciting for me, too, as I knew my kids were furthering their education and being exposed to new things and new adventures that I couldn't provide for them myself. Back then, the one thing I never thought about was their safety. Schools were such a haven that the idea of being safe never even entered my consciousness. It was simply a given. What a difference a generation makes. Starting with the epidemic of school shootings, which made active shooter drills as common as fire drills, schools were no longer automatically the place where you can go and drop off your kids and feel a sense of peace. And if that wasn't enough, the pandemic led to a lost year of school closings, remote learning, and a perpetual sense of anxiety and worry that things might never return to normal. Now that school is back in session, these concerns continue with added questions about the roles of vaccinations, mask wearing, social distancing, and room ventilation that gets in the way the reasons kids go to school in the first place, to learn. It also raises the question of what it is we're now teaching our kids. Are we teaching them to live in fear, to be anxious about being in public, to get to the place where they might even refuse to go to school? And is there a way to combat this? Well, as someone who's committed to helping others live their dream lives, you know I'm looking for answers that not only allay our fears, but help us move beyond them. To not only survive in this new world we're living in, but to thrive. And toward that end, I'm happy to welcome Florence Ann Romano to the Dream Power Show. Florence is a child care advocate who works tirelessly to promote both physically and mentally healthy children and a supporting community for them and their families. Welcome to the Dream Power Show, Florence. Thank you for having me back, Debbie. It's always so good to be here. Oh, it is my pleasure. Well, Florence, you know, in some ways we're in uncharted waters when it comes to creating a healthy atmosphere for our children in these times. Right. right. What can a parent do, for instance, when their child is so afraid that, that they demand that they don't go to school? I think we're seeing a lot of anxiety on both sides of it. I suppose, you know, we're always thinking it's the children who have the fear. It's the children that don't want to go back to school. And yes, that's obvious. Um, but what I'm seeing come out of COVID is all of a, all of a sudden, you're looking at these parents who are used to having their kids with them and they're used to now kind of controlling the situation and it's interesting to see parents all of a sudden have to go back to giving up that control and trusting other people with their children and it used to be like you said just commonplace you would just trust that school and you trust those teachers that's what we did but I think COVID made us all a little more fearful. And that's why I don't wanna just, you know, say it's just kids that are having a hard time with this transition. I think parents are too. And I think that's making the kids also feel a sense of anxiety because they're picking it up from their parents as well. 
kids are very perceptive that way. Energy is everything. And so um, I really want to concentrate on how both parties, parents and children, are coping with it and how they can help each other. Yeah, well, I tell you, you know, the truth is kids aren't going to be listening to this. It's the parents who are. Uh, and you're right. Kids don't live in a vacuum. And, right. you know, they are picking up things that are going on all around them. So let's talk about the parent. Uh, how does a parent deal with the fears that they have, whatever the fears may be? I think talking to other parents is important. I'm seeing a lot of my, my friends do that, where they're going to their friends and their community and saying, hey, I'm really struggling with this. Is this something you're feeling too? Is it just me? I think in life, we never want to feel we're like the crazy one, right? Like we're the only one who has these thoughts. And so I think parents are turning to other parents to help kind of calm them down in that way and say, okay, you know, I'm not alone in this. And I wonder if I can learn Learn something from these other parents. How are they coping? What are they doing? Yeah, the other thing is I am a big, big advocate of communication. I think we need to make sure that we're also communicating with our children. Children are fearful of things, and I think they think adults are not scared. You know, adults seem to have all the answers. Adults, you know, they, they don't get nervous. They, you know, I, they seem infallible. And I like being able to pull back the veil on that for children so they can see that the feelings they're feeling are also similar to what adults are feeling. And that validates them and also makes you relatable to them in a different way, on a different level. And I'm not saying be friends with your children when they're younger. It's just the idea of that emotional connection that makes it safe and then opens the door for more conversation because kids are resilient. They'll deal with anything. They're better at all that mask stuff than we are. You know, they just do what they're told. You know, we're all out here throwing a fit about it as adults, but they do what they're told and they do it happily most of the time. We could learn a lot from children actually. Um, but I think the most important thing is looking at the conversation and knowing that it's a safe place to have that conversation too with uh, your children and making sure that they know that there's no dumb question, that you don't make them feel intimidated or silly or embarrassed for asking something or feeling something. You know, think about yourself as an adult. And I always say this, we as adults want to be seen, heard, and understood. That's what's important to us. If we don't think about it, it's at least on that, you know, kind of subconscious level we do. Children want the same thing. So we want to make sure they see, they are seen, heard, and understood too. And because you're able to do that, because there's a re reciprocation of that, I think it makes it much easier for us to be able to explain what's happening. Even if we don't like what's happening, it doesn't feel good. It, it you know, just going back to school and the transition of it and still having to wear masks and things not being totally back to normal. You know, in life, you learn that things aren't fair. And you have to do things that you don't want to do sometimes, but it's important that we communicate to our children that we as adults have real feelings too, and we can validate each other's. Well, what about the parents who maybe don't, are afraid to admit that they're afraid? <laughs> Had, had the it, parents that admit they're afraid. I think today is the first day to do that. I think today is the first step to do that, that you can admit you're afraid. And there's a lot to be fearful of in the world, of course. But here's the good news. You're not alone in any of it, parents. Every single parent out there is dealing with exactly what you are. The fears of what's going on in, in school and getting your kids back and, you know, sickness and health and where's this pandemic going? Are we going to go back into a lockdown or are kids going to be back homeschooled again? And parents got through that and never wanted to do that again. So to think that they would have to do that again, I think causes a lot of anxiety. And the villages were taken away from all of these people, whether it was grandparents or a babysitter or whomever, a daycare, people were helping you take care of your kids. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and everyone was taken away from each other. And that was extremely traumatic. And I think everybody on some level is dealing with PTSD from it. Mm, I think that's so, so true. 
Uh, and th this is a question that perhaps relates more for younger children. Uh, last year, um, kids were home and uh, they had to interact with their teachers and their classmates via computer. And now they're faced with being in a classroom with these people face to face. What can a parent do to help them make that transition? It's funny that you say that because people have been talking about how even adults have to learn to be social again. Like we don't know how to like be with people anymore. I remember it was, it was recently like a few months ago, maybe. And it was like the first time I saw people in person. And I remember someone came up to me and gave me like a kiss on the cheek and a hug. And I was like, oh my God, As you, know, I'm like, you forget that like, you know, you could go back to that. But I do think that there is something to be said for re-entering society in that way. But that's the least of my worries, I think, for children, because you see it's like riding a bike. All of a sudden, you're back with people and you click back into that. And kids do. They've been missing their village. You know, we talk about how it takes a village to raise a child, but children have their own village. They have people that they need and count on. Um, so I've seen that that transition is the easier one out of them for kids. Another thing though, is that last year when kids were being uh, taught at home, uh, they had a lot of free time and probably all used a lot of that time, you know, playing games or watching media or being on phones uh, a lot more than experts say they should in terms of with their time. Uh, so now that, you know, they're, they're back in school and doing, you know, more of a structured thing, how can a parent keep them on, you know, having what I would call more healthier habits and, and not spend all their time, you know, being on screens? I, well, I had said that I really truly think that during COVID, you know, people were like, oh, kids are having too much screen time. They're doing too much of this and that. And I was like, if you take one thing away from these parents, when they've already had everything taken away from them, I, I, that was never me. I was never giving that advice of like limit that screen time. I'm like, just survive, get through this however you can. Now, like you said, we're back to a little bit more of a normal life. Yes, I think having a routine or going back to some sort of boundaries is important where you do have a schedule, you have a structure, you know, maybe you get screen time when you come home for school for an hour before you start your homework, or maybe it's what the reward is at the end of the night after you're done with your homework before bed, whatever it might be, you know, but I do think this is the time to start to start those routines again, to start those expectations again in the home. Uh, but like anything, it's moderation. You know, I am never an extremist in that way where it's like, you're taking everything away and we're not doing that anymore. And there's not gonna be any, you know, sort of technology. You know, everyone can do whatever they wanna do in their life. But I just feel like when the outside world has so much going on that is out of our control and there are things that have been taken away from us, like I said, I just don't believe in, in, in further punishing ourselves. So that's why moderation, I think, is always key. And something you also just said about schedules. So you think schedules are important and, you know, children respond to them. One of my friends was talking to me about how, you know, they had, they, they weren't doing their chores anymore. And they used to have a chore chart and do all of that every day. And they kind of got off of that with COVID and they brought it back now with the beginning of the school year. And they started it about a week before everyone went back to school, which I think is smart because you got to prepare for it. Um, but uh, they said that it changed actually leaps and bounds how their children were behaving. Uh, because they do crave that structure. They don't want to be told that they need structure. Don't tell the kids that, but they want it on, uh, on, a, on a level that maybe they can't access or realize. Um, but it does change the behavior of your child. It changes the rhythm of your home. So again, start small. Maybe it's a chore chart. Maybe it's something like that. 
Um, or maybe it's just, you know, you could be very simple. It's just the expectations or the values of the home that's taped to your refrigerator or something like that, but just something that's visible. That's a wonderful message to end this. I just have one final question. How can people find out more about you and your services? I'm all over social media. You can go to florenceann.romano for my website. I have lots of blogs there to help you out, but also very active on Instagram, florenceann.romano. I answer every DM I get. We've been speaking with child care advocate Florence. Lawrence Ann Romano. I hope you've enjoyed today's program. If you have, please tell all your friends, follow me, and drop a positive review on your podcast site. Until next time, this is Debbie Spector Weissman saying, sweet dreams, everybody.